All right, welcome to the second episode of Insure Innovation. Um, today we have Ed Hart, who's a senior vice president and director of the Center for Family Owned Businesses for First Bank. Ed, how are you today? I'm great, Benjamin. It's nice to meet you. Great to be here today. Thanks for having me in today. It's great. Likewise, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, so Ed uh, also is a published author, public speaker, and host of his own podcast, Hard Heart Podcast, which is heard in over one, 101 countries. Yes, yeah, I launched it in 2019, and it's called From the Heart. Mm-hmm. So my last name being Heart. So, mm-hmm. you know, From the Heart, kind of a play on my last name. Very clever. But also the purpose of the podcast is really when I interview people, I like to get to the heart of why they do what they do. So you can read a bio, you can read a resume, go on LinkedIn. But what you can't necessarily do is really find out why people do what they do. So I try to get to that when I'm talking to people. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I, th- I thought one statistic that I, that I read that was very interesting and somewhat impressive is that Ed also has eight grandchildren. Actually, the uh, is it more? Well, I was going to say the, <laughs> the bio needs to be updated. It is now nine. Nine. Yeah, okay. five six months ago, my youngest daughter had her third boy. So, and they're all boys. Wow, nine boys. The the oldest is twelve. The second oldest. I'm not going to go through all of them. The second mm-hmm. oldest turned twelve today. Mm-hmm. Today's his twelfth birthday. Fantastic. Friday, March fourteenth. Fantastic. And um, yeah, and then uh, seven more, all boys. That's Love it. Got my baseball team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Ed, um, how I usually like to start these interviews uh, is we, we have some industry specific questions sure. that we'll dive into uh, for our listeners. Um, but I always like to start with sort of getting to know the guests mm-hmm. a little bit. So if you wouldn't mind just sort of like giving us a rundown of who, who Ed Hart is and uh, how, how you how you entered this this family business? That's why I asked you how long we were going to go before we started recording. I don't know how much time I've got. So, I know. Yeah, so well, I'm an orange two minute guy. version. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the youngest of five kids. My parents were both they both since passed away, but they were executives and leaders here in Orange County for a number of years. My dad worked at Beckman Instruments for 39 years. Mm-hmm. My mom ran a center for women. Um, Women's Opportunity Center at UC Irvine for a number of years. So I've been around Orange County my whole life, youngest of yeah. five. Uh, the family business arena for me kind of happened by by accident, like a lot of people's careers do. Yeah, uh, I worked for three different family companies over the years. I like to say I worked for sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm-hmm. I worked for a family business that was a great business, but the family had a lot of dysfunction. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to name any names here, by the way. No. And then I worked for a family business where the family was just salt of the earth, great people, but they had trouble running the business. And that's the main reason why they brought a lot of us in, yeah. was to help on the business side. And then I worked for a family business that just seemed to get it all right. So a few years ago, I was working at USC up at up in LA, mm-hmm. and um, I heard about an opportunity to to lead a family business program at Cal State Fullerton. So I applied for, got that job, did that for eleven years, and I just I love working with family companies. I love mm-hmm. helping them through some of the dynamic issues that they have, some of the conflict, some of the succession mm-hmm. issues, leadership development. So. I just, I just have a real passion for family. It's, it's you know, seventy percent of the jobs that are created in our country are created right. through family businesses. So I really have a passion for that. Right. Well, that, that I feel like that's very noble. Uh, well, that's thanks. Well. <laughs> I do it because I love it. I'm one of those lucky guys that just yeah. found my passion. Right. You know, that's I mean, the key. They always say if you love what you do, you never work a day of your life. I don't it's totally. I mean, I I get that quote, but I work. Right. But I love what I do. I mean, I, right. I love that every day I get up and I get to. You know, meet with great people, do some fun stuff, and hopefully at the end of the day, make an impact on some of these families. Right. That's a very entrepreneurial mindset, I feel like. Um, and sort of uh, underscoring some of the statistics you just you just mentioned, uh, I was reading a stat earlier that said 87% of the American business are family-owned or controlled, as you mm-hmm. mentioned. Uh, but they also represent 54% of U.S. GDP and 59% of employment, meaning Family-owned businesses directly affect more than half of U.S. workers. Yeah, you either work for your family or you work for a family, <laughs> or you're doing business as a customer or a vendor with a family business. Right. We're, you know, we're in an election year. I guess we're always in an election, but we're in a presidential election year this year. And sure. I always joke, and I'm not a politician, and I never will be, but yeah. I think if a politician, local or national, would focus more on family business, yeah, they'd probably win in a landslide because that affects so many people. That's, that's, I think that's a very smart insight. Um, now, these numbers represent the vitality of family businesses in the U.S. from a statistical standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as you were beginning to touch on, 
sort of like in real world terms, in your own words, could you explain how family owned businesses or elaborate on how family owned businesses benefit the U.S. economy? Sure, absolutely. Well, I think number one, most people don't realize the magnitude of the companies that are family owned. I mean, if you drive a Ford or you go into Walmart or you've been to Nordstrom or drink Jim Beam or whatever, I mean, there's you know, family businesses that we, businesses that we're familiar with, we don't realize that they're family owned. Mm-hmm. It's like if I say, you know, I drive, I don't, but if I say I drive a blue BMW, now you're going to start seeing blue BMWs everywhere. Right. You know, I think that as I start thinking about family companies and people start talking about it, they start realizing how many more companies are family owned. Enterprise rent a car, you know, $30 billion family owned company out of St. Louis, which is where our bank, first bank is headquartered. Chick-fil-A. Um, Chick-fil-A family yeah. business, In-N-Out yeah. Burger family exactly. business. That's right. Most of the McDonald's, the, the, the corporation's not, but most of their franchisees are family okay. businesses as well. So... I think how it impacts the, the economy is just how many people, as we alluded to, are employed by family businesses, right. but also just the, the massive amount of products and services that are created by these family businesses is just, it's just astronomical. I think if you took a survey of most Americans, they could probably not name five family businesses, mm-hmm. but then if you ask them to make a list of the 25 places they shop the most, 20 of them are family businesses, they right. just don't know it. Right. We need to do a better job of getting that word out there of who these family businesses are and, and brand them a little bit more. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic point. Um, what many people don't know, Walmart. Sorry, it's, more, it's a small family business. Right. Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Chick Fil A, as, yeah. as we mentioned at one point, were, were small family businesses yeah. and, and grew into large organizations. Um, so, for small aspiring family businesses today. Who want to grow into large companies? Mm-hmm. From your experience, what are some of the things these companies did right? Meaning the Walmart of the world. What are some of the things they did right that family businesses today can learn from? It's a great question. I, not where I thought you were going with the question. So I, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to reprocess it in my head to answer yeah. actually what you asked. Mm-hmm. I think that never losing sight of who you were. Always always remember who you are. I mean, we told our kids growing up when we put them out the car door to go into store and remember who you are. That was our family tagline that, you know, to this day now they pass on to their kids, kind of a running joke in our family. But I think if you remember where you came from, remember your roots, I think that applies to everybody, not just a family business, but don't ever lose sight of the struggle that someone did to get you where you are today. Right. Uh, I mean, I, there are a lot of people, you know, your background, you have a lot of people in your heritage that struggle. Right. We all struggle, but I mean, for us to always remember where our ancestors came from, the sacrifices that were made for us. Right. You know, I look at um, I look at In and Out. I use In and Out Burger as a great example all the time. Number one, Lindsay Snyder, the owner, is a very dear friend of mine, so I talk about her a lot because she's a great friend. Yeah, her grandparents founded In and Out in 1948, so mm-hmm. 76 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, if you talk to Lindsay, she will talk about her grandparents and the heritage of In and Out more than she'll mm-hmm. talk about anything. Right, because she's really tuned into it. So I think just don't forget where you came from. Don't forget mm-hmm. the sacrifices mm-hmm. that were made on your behalf. Right, and you're making sacrifices today that hopefully your kids and grandkids will remember as well. So right. the other thing I tell where I thought you were going, if you if you allow me, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, what I tell young college students when I've taught them over the years, or what I tell these young family businesses that are starting out, is mm-hmm. find people who are doing what you think is successful. Right. Identify your definition of success, first of all. Yeah. Then find people who are doing that and go talk to them. Right. Buy them a cup of coffee. Right. Ask them to tell you their story. Mm-hmm. People love to tell their story. They love talking about their experiences, mm-hmm. their sacrifices, the right. things that they've done to get where they are. So I tell college students every day, you know, first of all, learn their name. Mm-hmm. Address them by name. Benjamin, it's good yeah. to see you today. People love to hear their name. Love to hear their name. And then right. tell them where you came from. Tell me your background. How did you right. get where you are today? Right. So. You, know, you do that with people. You're going to learn a lot. And you're going to get a lot of a lot of free lessons. Right. Yeah, I think it, it you know it goes back to this sort of cliche saying, but is very true that success leaves tracks. Absolutely. I love so that. these larger companies have created an imprint and almost a blueprint uh, for smaller family businesses to follow. Uh, I really like the point you made about being true to who you are, and I can see how that can be a challenge as a business grows. Sure. And you know, you, you you bring in a marketing director who may be younger and you know has a different way of uh, 
sort of interpreting the business values yeah. and in putting those ideas in a market and making sure that the founders uh, who are representing you know, the, the, the foundation of the company and how you start it just continues to be in the forefront uh, of, of the consumer's minds yeah. and, and, uh, and, and thoughts. I just think it's so I'm, I'm a huge sports fan and I love like my favorite baseball player today is Mookie Betts, plays yeah. for the Dodgers. One of the reasons I love about him, not just the fact that he's a talented ball player, obviously, but mm-hmm. as a human being, I've never met him, probably never will. But what I love about when I hear him talk is that he always talks about his roots. He talks about his heritage, talks yep. about his family, yep. talks about how he remembers every day when he didn't have anything. Right. And now, you know, he's making hundreds of millions of dollars to play the game that he loves. But I see him stop and autograph pictures for kids, take pictures with kids. It's like, well, that was me just a minute ago. Right. <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, just, just that remembering where yeah. we came from is so important. We lose sight of that. I think that I think that sometimes we think that, I don't know, I know a lot of people, and I've been guilty of this too sometimes, that when I feel a little bit of success, I like yeah. to feel proud. And you should feel pride for your success. Sure. But realize that your success was the end result of a lot of people's efforts, not just your own. Absolutely. Uh, so would you summarize that? In sort of labeling it as humility, that's the word that was popping up when you were talking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think humility. I would say my favorite people are people who are very authentic. Right. I think humility falls into that category. Right. You know, what you see is what you get. Someone's very real. Right. You know, if I can talk to a person for two or three minutes, I can get a pretty good sense of who they are and show how they talk about themselves. That's why right. address them by name, ask them to tell their story. Within a minute, okay, I already know. Am I checking out? Right. Or am I checking into this conversation? Right. And, 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 and as you're saying this, um, you know, I'm a business school student myself yeah. and also an entrepreneur. Um, but what I'm hearing is some of these principles we're talking about here, as you mentioned, are applicable across really category, are. Really cross are. segment. Regardless of what industry you're in, what job you choose, right. whether it's family business or otherwise, it applies everywhere. Awesome. Um, so now we have some more industry specific yeah, questions please. that I'm going to dive into happy quickly. To, happy to answer those. Um, how do you see the landscape of family-owned businesses evolving in the coming years, especially in the light of technological advancements and changing consumer preferences? Yeah, I've thought about that. I saw the question earlier, and I've been, I think about that and talk about that a lot. Something that I'm seeing, a transition that I'm seeing a lot now is I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1964. I'm the last, gener- last year of the baby boomer generation. Mm-hmm. There's Generation X after me. Then you get into the millennials and Gen Y and so forth. I think that the the younger generations are much more community minded, much more philanthropically minded than maybe my generation. Yeah. Our generation is that generation that can give because we're in our 60s or older and we've built our nest eggs and we're probably in that position where we're maybe financially giving back more. Sure. Maybe not. I don't know. That's just maybe that's a, a, a stereotype that I shouldn't shouldn't believe. But <laughs> I think what's happening in family businesses is you have a lot of younger generations who want to do multiple things. Yeah. You want to be involved. You want to start up a business. You want to give philanthropically. You want a lot of social time with your friends. You want to run a business. You want to be successful. But what I'm seeing in the family business front is a sort of a trend towards more non-family executives in a family business. Mm-hmm. You know, It might be my business or my wife and I have a business if we did. I mean, we don't, but if we did... It could be that we want to get more involved in our community and other things, and or maybe we don't have a child who wants to come into the company. Mm-hmm. So I think more and more family businesses are looking outside for help, yeah. and I think that's a good thing. I think that I think the right person in the corner office, so to speak, should be the right person, right. whether it's the right last name or not. That's a very very yeah. good point. Yeah. Um, in your experience, what are some effective strategies for fostering innovation and adaptability within family businesses? I'm going to give the same answer to a lot of the questions because it's yeah. so, for me, it's so important that we look outside of our own successes, our own strengths. Mm-hmm. Who's doing what we want to do better? AI is the big thing right now. Not yeah. the big thing. It's not. It's here to stay. Right. Uh, I've got a friend who runs a, a, a consumer packaging company. He designs logos for companies and helps them create their brand. He launched an organization all about AI about a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. and he's already won awards for the best AI company of the year. The things that they're doing, they're helping companies recognize that there are so many advances in ways that we can do things now. Mm-hmm. I guess what I'm saying is what used to work to get us successful back then isn't necessarily going to work today. Yeah. Yeah. And with technology, I mean, I, I'm old enough that 
you know, I was in my career when the internet came around. I was in my career when everybody first got an email and a cell phone. And so I've seen a lot of, it makes me sound really old here, but it, um, <laughs> and I am turning 60 soon, but, um, we're still the, young. Well, I'm still, thank you. Tell that to my left knee and I'm trying to get up and walk out of here in a minute. But, um, yeah, I, I think just recognizing that there's so many technological advances out there, and if you don't know much about it, go learn. Yeah, you know, I've I've decided to just jump in and learn about ChatGPT and all these other AI programs, and now I'm sort of uh, addicted to it. I go down rabbit holes all the time, designing images and mm-hmm. rewrite. I do a podcast, as you alluded to earlier, and I, I all my scripts and all of my show notes and everything are done through AI now because it, what used to take me hours wow. can take me sixty seconds. Wow. So it's just making me more, I think, more effective with my time. Right. Right. Um, embrace it, I guess, as though I would just embrace the technological advances and what you don't know, go find out. Find somebody who knows it yeah. or go learn it yourself. Are there are there any technologies plat- or platforms that are specific to family businesses that some of our listeners that are family businesses could, could look out for? I don't know about technologies, but I, I will tell you that there are a lot of programs out there. I know here at Chapman University is an example. We're launching a family business sure. initiative that I'll right. be a little bit a part of. I ran a family business program at another university locally here in Orange County for 11 years. Mm-hmm. There is an alliance of family business directors at universities around the world sure. that meet on a regular basis that are talking about technology, talking about you know succession planning, conflict resolution, leadership development, transition, and so forth. Most, if not all, of the issues that a family business needs to know. So that's not really an answer to your question of technology out there, but there's a lot of resources out there for family businesses. If you're right. wherever you are, if you're hearing this interview, mm-hmm. go into Google and just type in family business mm-hmm. programs, local family business programs, or something, and you right. get a list of the universities and sure. consultants that are out there in your area. You know, um, my entrepreneurial uh, <laughs> mind here makes me think that because family businesses make up so much of the U.S. economy. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see new innovations and technologies. Good point. Specifically targeting yeah. Yeah. how you can make those family businesses more efficient. Yeah, I think you're right. And if I stopped and thought about it for a while, there probably are there some probably out are there. Yeah. I know there's a lot of different like CRM programs that are Correct. out there that you know, can work in any company. But sure, this Directors Alliance that I've been a part of in different universities over the years, we're always looking for ways to not just – manage our donors and manage who's giving money to the program, but really manage the, it is a CRM for all intents and purposes, but really it's just how to kind of manage the family businesses in our, in technology and knowing what to do and how to help them out and, right. you know, logging every call. So that when I follow up with XYZ Corporation, I have my notes there for that. But yep. yeah, I'd be curious to see, you've got me now thinking about, you know, <laughs> <laughs> See, I like being a guest on a podcast because, you know, I don't, I like hosting right. better. Right, right. Because I don't have to be an expert on anything. But sure. as a guest, I figure you, you, there's some answers that you want from me that I'm not giving. But right. yeah, I don't, specific technologies, I, I'm sure that the minute the camera goes off, I'm going to think of five. Well, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe uh, you'll create your own. Hey, or we will. Who knows? Maybe, uh, exactly. Yeah. Maybe Young entrepreneurial student someone. like you. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That'd be a great outcome for this podcast. Hey, today. why not, right? Yeah, we'll go. We'll we'll, uh, we'll be that next Walmart. We'll be that next one. Yeah, we'll be. Saying, remember when we did that interview back at Chapman back in 2024? I love it. I'm in, man. Let's do this. Yeah, I love it. I see some synergies there. Absolutely. Uh, so we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, this is a more formal way of asking or reframing the question. Uh, how, how do you recommend balancing the preservation of tradition and heritage with the pursuit of innovation and growth? Specifically, growth at home businesses. Oh, man, you got great. These are some of the best questions that I've heard. I like these. I, I, I think a lot of it goes back to not forgetting who you are. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are so many new ways. There's, there's a family business I met up in Santa Barbara that launched 150 years ago making railroad ties. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is the wooden little things across the bottom of the train tracks. Mm-hmm. And that's what they did. Today, they make semiconductors for your cell phones. Mm-hmm. Now, to think of railroad ties to semiconductors, you don't think of how that could possibly tie together. But when you look at their journey, what they went from, from railroad ties to construction industry, to providing lumber for homes, to all the different things, and then the technology within homes. And it's just, it's easy to see how one step led to the other. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would 
suggest as the younger generation especially comes into a family-owned company, yeah. there's so much expertise there with their education and their passions. Yeah. How can we solve old problems with new technologies? How can we solve current situations with these new technologies? So mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in bridging that the generations. Yes. I love when the when the Gen Xers and the Millennials work closely with the, boom, the baby boomers because I think there's a lot of wisdom on both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my, my then... 89 or 90 year old dad mm-hmm. learned how to send a group text from my then 14 year old daughter. Wow. You know, I mean, he knew what the phone was and he, he knew he could call and he was just right. learning to text, but she taught him how to group text when my mom was in the hospital and everybody was reaching out. He could send one text to 15 people who were pulling away that he could do that. Wow. But I think there's those advancements out there in technology that, you know, we need to make sure our older generations embrace and, and go find that help. That's fantastic and, and a very great point. Um, well, we could definitely continue this no, conversation. I agree. We yeah, could go on for hours. Part here. one. This is part yeah. one. Um, I think of a very uh, informative conversation and in, in podcast. I, I felt that this was very inspirational. I too. appreciate that. And great, great questions. This was the the inter- the the interview is only as good as the interviewer. <laughs> so I mean, you have to have a good person to interview too. And I say that when I'm interviewing somebody else, but. Yeah, you can really lead the conversation well, and you got me got me thinking a lot. I'm going to walk away from here thinking about some of these questions for sure. Well, we really appreciate that, and we appreciate you having you on today. I want to thank our sponsors, ClickMo, um, and also the Chapman Liberty Center of Entrepreneurship and Business Ethics. I want to thank Kat for helping out with these mm-hmm. questions, uh, Mario, and also Cynthia. Excellent. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you, It was a pleasure. Great Likewise. time with you. Yeah. All right, I got a new friend here. Absolutely. Thank <laughs> you.